Good afternoon. I'm terribly excited to be able to have this discussion. We've had many conversations here about the greening of the world. We also have certain realities about oil. And I want to start with you, um, President Dali, about the vision. What gave you this perspective that the world could have from Guyana oil, that it could pursue biodiversity, and that you can pursue climate action at the same time? Well, it's not really a vision, it's a reality. Uh, our country, as you know, is blessed with a lot of natural resources. We have a forest the size of England and Scotland combined, storing 19.5 gigatons of carbon. That forest uh, is very valuable. We have been able to maintain uh, that forest with the lowest deforestation rate in the world, rich in biodiversity and ecological services. And we have been pursuing a development along a low carbon development pathway in which the forest plays a very key and critical role. So when you look at the importance of the forest uh, in the climate change agenda, you will know that Guyana is among the foremost countries in terms of forest management, preservation, and the deployment in a, uh, in a massive way of that forest to the, uh, to the world in terms of climate change. And then when you look at uh, the oil and gas sector, you know, the sector is emerging. It's a new sector uh, with huge reserves. The reality is even if we go up to 10 FPSOs, we will still be a carbon negative country, a carbon sink, a negative carbon sink. And that is because of the enormous uh, carbon that the forest, uh, the forest stores. Notwithstanding that, we are pursuing a development along this low carbon development strategy in which the forest will continue to be an integral part of the development mix and we will continue to pursue uh, energy mix that moves away from, uh, from heavy oil and petroleum product to include natural gas, uh, solar, and uh, wind. Notwithstanding that, we are of the view that the conversation along net zero that has now become a, con a conversation uh, in this conversation and not how do we create a balanced set of policies and programs to achieve net zero uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. So I think that it is very important for us to get back to that balanced conversation. And for that balanced conversation to take place, it requires all the stakeholders around the table and not the locking out of, uh, of uh, companies and countries who are uh, investing in, in uh, oil, uh, petroleum products. Um, President Duque, let's pick up on that point about oil. Why does the world need oil? So I think, uh, Carlos, it's very important to understand that the global south has different challenges and we need to finance the transition, not only the energy transition, the economic transition, the uh, environmental transition in a sustainable way. Uh, as President Ali was mentioning, I, I really, I'm really impressed by his efforts to keep on promoting the low carbon development strategy, being a zero deforestation country, having 40% of, of the land in the hands of indigenous communities with land titles, and trying to change the energy matrix so that they don't depend on oil to generate electricity, but they also use the richness of the oil to face the social challenges the country has. And I'll give you the example in a country like Colombia. In Colombia, the oil sector represents uh, almost 47% of the exports. It represents 35% uh, of the foreign direct investment, more than 25% of uh, the investments you have in the local capital markets, and almost 20% of the tax collections. So without the oil sector, it will be almost impossible for Colombia not only to keep on increasing and improving the social safety net, but also to use resources to invest in this transition. And that's something that has to be very well understood. And also something that is very important in the case of, of Guyana. Guyana 
is now a country that has in reserves. It has a population of more than 200,000 square kilometers, and it has literally the population of Vermont. So Guyana is also a food security provider for the Caribbean and the region. Guyana is an energy security provider, and they need these resources to allow better education, better health, better infrastructure. So I think having that balance is possible. And I'll finish by saying that the example of Canada is quite interesting. You have a country that is a, it's a power in, in, in forestry, but it's also a power and in conservation, and it's a power in oil and gas. It's also a power in mining, but it's also a power in sustainability policies to accelerate the decarbonization of even sectors that are difficult to abate. So I think it's that balance what, what it's needed, and that's why we can't be ideological about it. We just have to think on the balance and how we make the transition possible while allowing the, 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 the people in need to improve their quality of life. It's quite striking that demand is one of the hardest things to change, and if you can't satisfy that demand, I don't need to tell you as two politicians that when you can't actually satisfy that demand, prices increase, life gets complicated. But let's come back to a point that you mentioned earlier, President Dale, about building consensus and creating a dialogue with stakeholders. You had something quite extraordinary on the low carbon development strategy. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, before I get into that, though, I, I want to get back to a point you raised on, on how, how do we meet that demand. I mean, the U.S. has uh, showed, showed us recently how to meet that demand. They issued more license to ramp up production. So uh, meeting demand requires production. Um, so when we have this conversation about uh, locking out new entrants to, to the market, that is not a balanced conversation. That is a conversation that sometimes I, I wonder about. Because if you are to lock out new entrants into the oil market and you're making it more difficult for the, those entrants to get capital to finance the production, you're making it more uh, difficult, you're, uh, you're increasing the risk uh, factor for those entrants, then you're, pro you're protecting a monopoly that exists. And you're allowing that monopoly to grow by ramping up production. So, uh, so demand is indeed a, a big issue, and we can be part of the solution in relation to that demand. Now, the low carbon development strategy is a strategy that seeks to create that balance in the development not of, only of Guyana, but all forested countries. For a very long time, forest was not even on the agenda, the climate agenda. And you're aware, my, my friend is aware of that because he is one of the champions to get forests on the agenda. Guyana came out with a low carbon development strategy in which we present the forests uh, uh, as part of the holistic solution for, uh, in, in, in climate change and in managing the effects of climate change. Now, that forest has a value. It has a standing value. And there is a value for the, the carbon it stores. Now, who is going to pay for that value? Who is going to bear this? On, there's opportunity, uh, opportunity costs. If you're not, you're not going to cut the, the forest down, if you're going to uh, uh, utilize the forest in a sustainable way, then there must be a value for your contribution. Today, as I speak to you, there is still a voluntary market. There is no structured market, uh, carbon market for the forest. When are we going to have that conversation as to how we uh, finalize the arrangement to have a full-fledged structured market for, uh, for car carbon storage and the, and the role of the forest? That is what is going to help us, because the cost of adaptation uh, is enormous. You have Latin America and the Caribbean, for example. Aside from the financing uh, gap in terms of climate change and transition to cleaner energy, you have a situation where we are off track the SDGs, uh, of the SDGs in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it requires billions of US dollars of investment with a situation where the uh, the debt to GDP ratio is 117%. Um, you have inflation rate uh, at, at the end of uh, 2022 at 9.2%, rising uh, food insecurity. So all of this, and all of that is addressed in the low carbon development strategy. The low carbon, carbon development strategy 2030 expands into the marine economy. How are we going to ensure the functionality of the environment, safeguarding the environment, keeping the forest, but at the same time ensuring 
that the livelihood of the people, that the economic development of the country, that the transformation of the country is not at risk. Because you can keep the forest, uh, at the same time, you have to find resources to give the indigenous community, uh, the, the citizens of Guyana, good health care. You have to give them uh, education. You have to give them infrastructure. You have to give them water. And then we are, living, we are living in a world in which the disparity continue to expand, expand itself. Take, for example, in the era of modernization and mechanization, the developing world was left behind because it did not have the capital to mechanize. The developed world went ahead and mechanized. They became more competitive. Now we have digitization, again, widening the gap between the developing world and the developed world. Who is going to finance that gap? When, when are the developing countries going to get the full opportunity to exploit their resources to ensure that they can survive in this highly competitive environment? That is why the balance is, is required. And that is why the LCDS is a holistic approach to finding that balance in terms of managing the environment, ensuring the livelihood of, of, of the people, promoting economic uh, wealth, creating equal, uh, equality, bridging inequality, and ensuring that the aspirations of Guyana and the people of the world are met in a balanced approach. So first of all, the critical need to eradicate disparity, to use the resources that you have to be able to balance those resources with the ability to absorb carbon. And President Duque, I'll come back to you because you've been quite deeply involved with an Amazon initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that fits into this picture and the strategy of being able to absorb carbon? The fact is, uh, Carlos, we talk a lot about fighting climate change, becoming carbon neutral, but Without the Amazon, none of the Western Hemisphere NDCs will be met. Today is not only the, the home of the world's uh, biodiversity. You definitely need enforcement because most of the environmental crimes in Latin America and especially in the Amazonic countries don't have imprisonment sentences. So people can go and with all due impunity destroy the jungle and they won't get a, a severe sentence from justice. So you need to update your law and order. But you also need to create a new economy. So how do you put away the incentives from illegal, illegal uh, illegal crops or illegal uh, uh, cattle or illegal wood or illegal mining. You have to create an aggregated value chain economy based on Amazonic products. And that was something we debated in the Concordia Summit that we had in Ecuador, where somebody raised the issue, why don't we get the Amazonic products that can reach the retail, uh, food retail in the United States to have FDA acceptance in a fast way. Camu Camu, Sacha Inchi, Copo Azul, among many. So those are elements that you need to, to, to have there. And then you have two additional elements that are crucial. How much and how are you gonna pay communities to preserve? Because as President Ali just said, many people say, well, I'm not gonna pay you for the jungle that already exists. Why am I going to pay now for all the things that have been there forever? And you have to say, 
the preservation, the conservation, and the restorage is the right way to pay communities to sustain that bioma in the planet. And last but not least, Carlos, is how do we create massive mobilization of capital through market mechanisms? And that's where carbon credits, biodiversity credits, play an amazing role. And what the countries need is not the demand. The demand is there. Colombia has 145 carbon credit projects that have already been issued. What we require is the supply, which is give the technical assistance, help the countries put together the projects that are trustworthy, that are integral, and that can be scrutinized over time. And this issue of carbon markets is a huge one that we need to address. I mean, you have re regulated markets and where the price of carbon, say, in Europe will be close to $100 a ton. And in Latin America, it may be cents. And those issues are going to have to be resolved as part of this process of, of capital flows. Um, okay. President so, Ali. So just to make please. a point, though, on, on, on the scale, our forest uh, is, is jurisdictional scale. The entire forest is R3 certified. So all the carbon there is high quality carbon certified. And we are the only country mm -hmm. to date uh, in terms of the forested country, we have been able to achieve an end user agreement with HES Corporation uh, that is in the sale of carbon for $750 million. So we have, we have shown how the model can work. We had a bilateral agreement on sale with the Kingdom of Norway. So it is not that this model cannot work, but also we need a political will globally. The will to say that the market uh, is not going to be a voluntary market. We set the rules for the market, and then you have a fair price on the market. This is critical, and, and I agree totally. Unless we are able to answer this critical question, then where, where is the resources going to come for adaptation? Where is the resources going to come from? And where are the resources going to come from for us to achieve the SDGs and bridge the financing gap? I think you leave us with an absolutely critical to-do item here of how to address the equity of those markets, how to finance the SDGs, because that's one we haven't figured out yet and we absolutely need to do. Um, President Ali, I, I want to close with you and ask you to talk about, again, go back to the issue of vis vision. The year 2030, we're at a critical point in time right now, an essential juncture. What is your vision for what you want to leave for you, Guyana in 2030? How would you see the country um, in seven years from now? Well, what we want to leave is a country that is sustainable, one that is resilient, highly competitive, and functional. A country that is leading in energy security, leading on climate security, and leading in food security. These are the three areas in which we are building out the infrastructure and the ecosystem so that we can provide global leadership. There must be no conversation globally on energy, food, and climate without Guyana being in the lead table. That is where we want to position the country, and one in which the people of our country must have access to world-class healthcare, world-class education, world-class infrastructure, and the infrastructure of the country is built not in a fanciful way, but to promote growth, expand economic opportunity, and improve the livelihood of our people. President Duque, words of advice as we close out. More than advice, I think it's action. And I have been uh, very honored to be able to talk with President Ali uh, about all these policies, what we did in Colombia on 30 by 30, what we did in energy transition, what we also did in national conservation contracts, clearly demonstrates that things can get done. And what I like about what you asked to my good friend, President Ali, is he has a vision, and he has shared the vision. But you only get to materialize all this energy transition, conservation, and this, connect, con this, this sort of a, of a connection between how you manage the energy transition and bring uh, solutions to your population. It takes one thing. It has to be led by the president. That was how we got things done with a, an amazing team. But you need to take the presidential leadership. And that's why when I see President Ali, I always say, you're leading this, and that's why the world is now looking at Guyana as a land of opportunity. Well, we thank you both for your lessons on leadership, competitive, security, energy, food, climate, people having access to resources. Phenomenal sum up, Player President Dali. Let's give them both a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Fabulous.
Please welcome to the 